In this episode, we'll look at how we can configure Jest to run our React tests by using the Enzyme test library. We'll then write the very first test for one of our React components. So just to be clear on the distinction between the different libraries we're using, we're writing our components using React, and we're going to use a tool from Facebook called Jest as the test runner. Jest is a really good tool that lets you run the tests you've written. It gives you really good feedback, it watches your files and reruns tests when they change, and is generally a really nice testing tool with a really nice API. Enzyme is a React specific testing library. It provides a bunch of functions and methods that make it really easy for us to test React components. So Jest will be running our tests, but our actual tests will use the Enzyme library to make them really easy to write. So just to save some time, I've already configured a quick demo application that we're going to use and installed some dependencies. So here I've installed React and React DOM, and in the dev dependencies, you can see I've configured Babel such that we can run this app in the browser if we want. And then the important bits are these three down here. We have Enzyme, the Enzyme React Adapter, and Jest. So as we just mentioned, Jest is the test runner itself that will execute on the command line to run our tests. Enzyme is the actual framework that provides nice methods for helping us test React components. But the thing about Enzyme is it's built to support different versions of React. I'm currently using the latest version of React, which at the time of this recording is 16.2 but you might be in an application at work, say, that's still running React 15. So along with Enzyme, you also have to install what's called an adapter. And there's one of these adapters for every version of React that Enzyme supports. In our case, we've installed the Enzyme adapter for React 16. If you were using React 15, you'd install the Enzyme adapter for React 15. Because of this adapter system, there's a small bit of configuration that we need to apply to tell Enzyme which version of React we'll be using. So let's go and see how we can do that now. Inside the test directory, you'll see there's two files, setup.js and shim.js. The first file we're looking at here is shim.js. One of the browser APIs that React depends on is request animation frame. And when we run our tests through Jest, that isn't available to us. So what I've had to do here is just set up a quick polyfill for request animation frame. So onto the global object, which under test will be the equivalent of the window object if we were running in a browser, we declare this request animation frame function. It's going to take a function and all we're going to do is run that via set timeout. The second file is called setup.js and this is where we configure Enzyme to use the React 16 adapter. You can see here I've imported Enzyme and on the line below I've imported the adapter from the Enzyme adapter React 16 package. Again, if you were using a different version of React, this is where you would import that version. We then call the configure method on Enzyme, and we give it an object with one property called adapter, and we pass in a new instance of the React 16 adapter. This tells Enzyme that we're going to use it on a React 16 app that has React version 16 components inside it. So we have shim.js and we have setup.js, and these are two files that both need to be run every time we run Jest to run our tests. I've created a file here called jest.config.js. This file will automatically be imported and passed by Jest for us. One of the keys that we can pass is setup files. This takes an array of files that Jest should run before each block of tests. So in our case, we need to run shim.js, and then we need to run the setup to configure Enzyme correctly. To tell Jest where these files are, we're going to pass a couple of strings, which are the file location. Jest has a handy little feature called root dir. If we refer to a file path using this root dir directory, Jest will swap that out for the current project that we're working in, the current folder. And so this is the best way to tell Jest where your files are. By using this root dir placeholder, it's the best way to ensure Jest will find them. And it's also clear as you, the developer, where this file is coming from. So in this case, I'll say root dir slash tests slash shim.js. And I'll do the same again with slash tests slash setup.js. So with that, Jest now knows that when we run it, it should first run these files for us. Now let's go and have a look at the component that we're going to write a test for. Our component here is a pretty basic counter component where I can click increment count and you can see that the count does indeed increase. This is a very basic component, but it will allow us to write a test for now that will demonstrate the abilities of Enzyme. So I'm back in Atom and you can see counter.js contains this component. It's a React class component. It has some initial state where the count is zero, has an increment function, which takes the previous state and returns a new state where the count has been incremented by one. And then we have our render function, which outputs the current count and has a button with an onclick that calls the increment function. 
There are many conventions for naming of test files, and Jess normally is pretty good at finding them. The convention I like is that the test file for a component is the same name, but with .test.js on the end rather than just .js. So we've got counter.js. I'm going to create a new file called counter.test.js. The first thing I'm going to do in this file is import our dependencies. So the first thing I need to do is import React. We also need to import the actual counter component that we're going to test. There are different ways in Enzyme that you can test a React component. The way we're going to use today is what's called shallow rendering. When you use shallow rendering, when you render a component in a test, the component isn't actually fully rendered into the DOM, but it gets converted into a JSON representation of what would have been rendered. This is normally good for more straightforward components. You save the time and complexity of having to fully render a component to the DOM, but at the same time, you can still assert on what would have been rendered in real life application. To use the shallow rendering API that Enzyme provides, I'm going to import the shallow function from Enzyme. Next, let's write our actual tests. Jess lets us group tests together using the describe keyword. So I'm going to say describe and let's say the counter component. And the second argument here is a function. And in here, we write individual tests using the it function. So I'm going to say it starts with a count of zero. Now in this function, we can write the actual test. So the first thing we need to do is actually render the component and get an instance of it. So I'm going to create a new constant called wrapper. Wrapper here is the name I tend to use for these, these objects that are wrapping a React component that's being tested. You can use different names, but wrapper is a, is a handy convention that I've stuck by and will use throughout this series. Here we call the shallow function that Enzyme provides and we actually give it the React component or the JSX that we want to render. So in our case, we want to render the counter component. Now I have this wrapper object, I can make assertions on it. One of the functions available to me from Enzyme is the state function, which lets me get at the state of a component. So I could say here the const count state is equivalent to wrapper.state.count. And I could expect that the count state should equal zero. So here I'm creating this wrapper, which is the result of shallow rendering our counter component. I'm using the enzyme state function to pull out the state that that component has. And I'm reading the count property of it. And I'm expecting via the expect that it equals zero. Jest has a huge library of different assertions we can make, and we'll see more of them as we go on. So let's see how we'd actually run this test. To set up a shortcut, I'm going to set up an npm script in our package.json that will execute Jest for us. All our test script will do is just execute Jest. So now if I go into my terminal and I run yarn run test, you'll see that that runs Jest and our component does indeed pass the test. It does start with a count of zero. I can actually shorten yarn run test just to yarn test as well. There are a few script names that yarn lets you run without typing the explicit run command because they're very common and test is one of them. It's very annoying having to run this every single time we want to check our tests. Jest comes with a really nice watch setup that means it will watch your files for changes and run the test automatically. Just before we continue, I'm gonna make the terminal a bit bigger here so we've got a bit more room to see the output from our tests. Running yarn test every single time we want to run the test is fine, but when we're developing and changing files quite a lot, we want to do that automatically. Jest comes with a really nice watch mode. So it'll watch our files for changes and run the tests automatically. To do that, we run yarn test and pass it dash dash watch as the argument. This will run Jest in its watch mode it will run the test. You see now it's sitting here waiting for changes. For example, if I now change this assertion to say I'm expecting the state to equal one, it's going to rerun the test and you can see that it's failed accordingly. Now, although this test is passing, it's actually not a very good React test. You should try to avoid React tests that actually reach in and read specific state values out of them. It's much better to think of these React tests as being from the perspective of a user. So a user can't look into the counter component and see that its state is zero but it can look at the output from the counter component and see what the state is there. So rather than reading state directly, you should test the outputs of your components rather than reach into them and read their internal state. So I'm gonna change this test to say that the text the component outputs, which we'll get at via wrapper, and then we'll use find, which lets us find a DOM element within the component. So the counter component outputs a button and a paragraph. Here I'm gonna find that paragraph and then call the text function which gets the string of text that's being rendered from that component. We can then say that we expect text to equal, and I happen to know that the string will be current count colon zero. Now this test is passing, but it's now a much better test because it's seeing the same output that a user would. So it's a much more valuable test. And we can see what happens if we break that test. So that brings us to the end of episode one. In the next episode, we'll continue testing and we'll look at how we can test user interaction 
by writing a test for the counter component where the user clicks on the button and we can check that the count has indeed incremented.